Good morning. Two quick administrative questions. One, can you hear me okay in the back? You can hear me fine. I know you probably can't see me, but that's my parents' fault. <laughs> um, and is my presentation up on the screen? No. So if we can grab the presentation up on the two screens. Great. All right, we're ready to go. So firstly, uh, I really want to say that it's a, a privilege for me to get a chance to speak to you all. It's uh, a rare and uh, often sobering experience for me to speak to journalists and people in the media profession because what I do three years ago was seen by many of them as the rise of the enemy. And in fact, what we found is it's been quite different. And what I want to do is not necessarily talk to you just about citizen journalism. What I want to talk to you about is, is about the next 730 days. That in fact, we are standing at a very critical fork in the road as human beings. And it's actually a very, quite a scary place. On the one hand, you have more demographic change than you have ever had at any other point in human history. We are seeing incredible swelling of different age groups that are fundamentally different people in their behaviors than they were a decade ago. We are not the same people we were a decade ago. You have Gen Y and the Millennials, people born 1981 and after, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And these individuals do not think, act, socialize, or have expectations around news in the way that we do. For the most part, they're primarily aliens compared to us. You then have a middle fork in the road, which is, which is technology. And on the technology front, we have seen more change in a decade than we've seen at any other point in human history. So you now have the web, which answers a very important question for us sociologically, which is if every human being on the planet was connected within the click of a button, how would that change us as people? And in fact, we are seeing the reaction and the result of that today that we are now connected within the click of a button, whether it's through a mobile device or the web, the shrink in the actual space between us as people is fundamentally different. And the third, of course, is the environment. So now we stand in a place where we are reaping what we have sowed, that the Earth's core is at its hottest temperature since it's been from the melting of the polar ice caps, and we are facing all kinds of challenges, which Tom referred to earlier, about how we get ourselves out of the mess that we've put ourselves in. So the reality is, there is no such thing as a futurist when it comes to journalism or technology. All we know is that 10 years ago, had people told us what was going to be happening today, we probably would never have guessed it. If you fast forward to 730 days, you will see incredible change compared to where we were before. And what I want to do is give you a bit of an insight into where we're going to be over that period and how journalism is going to change. And this was the turning point, I think. It was this moment in time, the tsunami in Southeast Asia, where we changed fundamentally as human beings. We went from being a culture of people that had a line of communication where we were spoken to, where we were observers, to being participants in our own world. This was, for all intents and purposes, the first account of a global event where people like you and I covered it became the eyes and ears for the world, where you had people standing in the line of the human crisis, and instead of protecting themselves, or instead of running, or instead of looking to traditional journalism to cover what was going on around them, they covered it themselves. That moment changed from where we became watchers to where we became people that lived and observed and shared. It was a fundamental turning point for which we have not yet turned back. And this is another one of those moments in that evolution. This is a hand, a photo that was uploaded to Now Public. It's a photo of an intake officer at the Houston Astrodome during Hurricane Katrina. And why this is important is because this photograph shows the difference between user-generated media and traditional media. This was an example of an intake officer who had run out of paper and had run out of pens and had basically run out of time. Took a photo of her hand with all of the phone numbers of the people that were trying to connect with their families, uploaded it to the internet through us and multiple other sites, and within 45 minutes, three families were united in New Orleans because of this one photograph. 
It is the power of the change of what it goes to when you move from a passive role in media to an active role. And what I will do over the next sort of 30 minutes is walk you through the questions of how did we get here? Because if you look at those examples and you think about this fork in the road that we're at, the bitter reality is many historians have taken great pride in thinking that we can predict our future from our past. But I would argue that actually fundamentally today we are at a point in history where we cannot that there are only small elements that we will be able to understand based on our past because there are three fundamentally different elements that have changed at our foundations. And I'll talk about each of them. One is time, the other is access, and the other is economics. I will then talk to you a little bit about citizen journalism and crowdsourcing. So first of all, all I really want to say about citizen journalism is that it is a fallacy. It does not exist. Citizen journalism was a term invented by journalists to define an activity that they could not understand. What citizen journalism is, is not journalism at all. Journalism is a skill, it is an art form. Simply because you have a camera doesn't make you a movie producer. Journalism requires analysis and skill set and talent. The difference of what we do and what all of us do is we are an army of eyes and ears that can see and witness and experience and be there where traditional journalism and coverage cannot. So there is a fundamental difference between journalism and reporting, or eyewitness reporting in particular. So when you hear people talking about citizen journalism, remember that the journalism part is actually, for the most part, a fallacy. Crowdsourcing. You'll hear a lot about crowdsourcing over the next year if you haven't heard a lot about it already. Crowdsourcing is one of those terms that people use that sounds complicated, but it's pretty easy to understand. All crowdsourcing means is you take a task that was normally very expensive, that was done by one person or a team of small people, and you use economies of scale through the web and mobile to actually take that task over thousands if not millions of people. And there are lots of great examples of it. If I have time, I'll tell you more outside of the journalism space, because I think one of the great leveling effects of the web and mobile is that it has allowed us to actually use those economies of scale to get a lot smarter and a lot more efficient at some of the things we've traditionally done. I'll tell you a little bit about my company, about Now Public, what we do, what we've done on a daily basis over the last three years. I will then also talk about the changing face of breaking news in journalism, and not just how technology has changed it, but also from those three forks in the road, particularly demographics and technology, why the market that we are walking into in the next three years is fundamentally different than it was even six months ago. And I'll tell you what we've learned. Now, Public was really the pioneer of citizen journalism, with the exception of Oh My News in Korea, which is a very different model than what we do. We were really the first people doing this in the market. And over the three years that we have been engaged in user-generated news, we've learned a lot. I'll also tell you a little bit about what's next, and again, I am not a futurist. I barely know what I'm going to eat for lunch. So what I can tell you is what we think, where the market is headed, and where we're going over the next 730 days. And then I want to leave you with uh, what I think you can do, what people in the media can do, what journalists can do, what citizens and just human beings can do to be active participants in this process and not let it slip you by. So I said at the beginning that it was very difficult for the old theory of history that our past will predict our future to be true and correct. Because there are some foundational things that have changed in humanity and in society that I'm not sure we all yet understand 100%, but it will make our future very difficult to predict based on our past. And the first of those foundational elements is time. Now, it is clear that we know historically that everything has a cycle. Stock markets and stock market bubbles will have cycles. Real estate markets will have cycles. The education of a 13-year-old child will have a cycle. And although I don't know the answer, and physicists struggle to figure it out theoretically every day, what is undeniable is that over the last thousand years, time has shrunk on us. Time is the only commodity that we do not own, and it is actually physically shrinking. Our cycles are shrinking. So take a look at the stock market, what Tom mentioned earlier. 
The first stock market bubble, effectively, one of the first, was the tulip bubble in Holland. The next major stock market crash came 65 to 70 years later. If you look at the dot-com disaster in 1999, basically 2000, the next market crash came effectively eight years later. We shrunk from 65 to eight years, and as Tom showed you on his graph, it is expected, and I also believe, that the next market crash will come in and around 2013, five years later. So the markets are shrinking, time is shrinking. The next bubble, the next crash, the next cycles will become shorter and shorter and more intense and more intense. If you take a look at simple things, like the education of a 13-year-old, there is no question that 13-year-olds across the world, developing world and otherwise, are much smarter than when we were 13 years old. I mean, my 13-year-old nephew came to visit me in Vancouver a few months ago, and he had in his knapsack a copy of Thomas Friedman's Flat Pot and Crowd, the new book about, uh, about Thomas' view on, on the world and the environment. And when he stepped off the plane, I said, no, he's 13, I said, what are you doing with that book? Is it for school? And he said, no, it's not for school. I'm just really concerned about the globalization of our planet, how it's affecting the economy. And I was like, what? <laughs> when I was 13, I could barely chew gum. <laughs> so there is no question that time is shrinking on us. And although I don't offer an explanation, and neither do theoretical physicists, the truth is that our cycles are shrinking. The second foundation that has fundamentally changed is access. I said to you before, imagine what would happen if every human being on the planet was connected at the click of a button. And as Tom rightly pointed out, as mobile proliferation occurs, and just to give you a sense of that expansion, it is expected today, and numbers differ a little bit depending on who you talk to, roughly on Earth today there are 400 to 500 million personal computers, Macs and PCs. There are today north of 2 billion mobile phones. Is that about right? Three. Three. See, it grew. Three billion mobile phones. It is anticipated by 2012, 2013, that that number will double. What's interesting about that is it is expected by 2012 and 2013 that 80% of those devices will be fast broadband enabled. And not fast broadband is in the 3G context, but moving to 4 and 5G where you will have faster web connectivity on your device than you will in your home or your office. So fundamentally, this concept of access and immediacy has taken us to a level that we have never seen historically before. The third foundational change that has occurred, and I think this is actually the most important, and it's the one that's not talked about a lot, and that is the sliding scale in economics. Chris Anderson from Wire Magazine wrote a book called Free, and in that book he argued that we were moving due to costs and other economies of scale to a market where things that people used to pay for were now going to be free. I think Chris is right, theoretically, but there's something that he's missing, which is that what we are experiencing now is not just a credit and a debt crisis. It is a crisis based on everything I've just talked about, which is access to incredibly fast immediacy of people, shrinking of time, changing in demographics, and what that has led to is a clear exposure in the fact that many businesses got wrong what people were willing to pay for. They misunderstood the value chain. And the greatest example of that was the music business. And by the way, journalism is on its heels with the same problem. The music business, when Napster and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing started, and I used to work in a prior life, at Universal Music in the States and in Canada. They all thought it was about thievery, but it was never about thievery. It was never about theft. It was about people that were telling a company and an industry that they were offering a product at a price and in a medium and format that they didn't want. And in fact, as we're finding, the value for most people is not in buying music, it's in experiencing music. And the music business is just starting to understand where the real value chain sits in the economics of what they do. Journalism is facing the exact same crisis. The question is, what do people really care about? What are they willing to pay for? Why has the CEO of Ryanair in Ireland committed 
that by 2012, he believes that not a single seat on his airline will cost a penny. That people don't value the point A to point B. It's an expectation. What they value is everything else around them. Entertainment, baggage, quality of food, all of the other things that they'll pay for except for the seat. So these three foundational changes have made it very difficult for us to know where we're going based on our past. Let me tell you a little bit about my company and what we do at Now Public. So when we started Now Public, it was started by three fairly senior entrepreneurs in the space who knew nothing really about news, but set out with a very, very lofty goal. To do to the news business what Skype did to the telecom business. To create overnight, 15 years overnight, I should say, the largest news network in the world. And to do that using crowdsourcing, which is what I mentioned earlier, taking a task where if a bomb went off, or a plane went down, or the 500th home run was hit, whatever it was, where normally it would be difficult to have a human being there, we would have multiple human beings there covering the story. Because the theory was, when news happens and when news breaks, someone was going to be there, and that someone was going to be able to record it. So effectively what we were doing was building an organization that if Baron von Reuters hadn't started Reuters and he had to do it all over again today, what would it look like? Now, what we did do, which I think is interesting, is we thought we were in the news business, but in fact we're not in the news business. What we actually are is in the intelligence business. In effect, what we have created is an environment where everyone can watch and monitor and listen and plug into conversations as they happen live time around the world. So we've basically built a news intelligence network which didn't exist before. And the company today is the fastest growing news agency in the world. We have more coverage and more reporters in more places than any other news agency on the planet by far. And I'll explain that in a minute. We raised about $12.5 million led up venture capital in New York. We are large partners with the Associated Press. We currently have at our own web property over 3 million readers a month. And we have today, which is I think amazing, we produce about seven to 800 stories per day and from 160,000 contributing reporters in over 160 countries and over 6,000 cities, which includes six paid bureaus that we have. Our editor-in-chief is Rachel Nixon, who was the deputy world editor of the BBC in London. Now, what's important to note about that 160,000 number is that 160,000 made up in there is also 7,000 professional journalists. So on an apples-to-apples -apples basis, in terms of our numbers, we are 20 to 25 percent larger than the Associated Press on a very comparative basis. So how is news changing? And how is the changing face of breaking news and journalism going to affect us? The first thing I think that's important to remember is that the very cycle of news has changed. News was typically something that was historical. Once it was posted, it had already happened. So the cycle went a little something like this. It went, an event occurred, somebody witnessed it, and it was reported. And typically that's where the traditional news organizations stopped their coverage. Now, some would argue through letters to the editor and comments and feedback loops that in fact there was a bit of a change. Maybe that's so. But what has happened in the last even seven months is that cycle has changed dramatically. Now, after it's reported, however and whomever reported it, the crowd, wherever they may be, interacts with the event and with people live time as it's happening, actually thereby changing the event as it occurs. So if you look at the way news is actually evolving today, news is no longer about something that is reported. It is no longer about something that is historical. It is about somebody notifying the world that something is going on and allowing the world to interact with that event live time and actually change that event as it's occurring. It gives you and I the ability through blogging, <coughs> microblogging, photo, video, phone, to actually change the very course of history. And I'll give you a small example of how that happened in our world and now public. At the Republican Party convention in Minnesota, 
we got notified through some of our own systems that there was a riot and a protest breaking out outside of the theater. Once it became clear that several people were reporting that this was happening, all of a sudden, people from all over the world interacted with the people through Twitter, through us, through other platforms, with the very rioters on the ground. Someone sent a notice saying the police are about to bring in riot gear. Hundreds of people who did not live in Minneapolis phoned the Minneapolis Police Department. The phone was ringing off the hook, so finally the police stood down. All caused by an interaction from people who didn't even live there. Again, an example of the news changing and history changing from people who were passive participants elsewhere from where the event was occurring. But what Tom said is correct, that what it does not replace is analysis. So analysis comes after. So the New York Times long ago, almost a year and a half ago, gave up on the fact that they were a news organization. When you read the New York Times and you read their headlines, over a year and a half ago they changed their philosophy that they assume you know the news. They assume already that you know what's happened. What they're trying to do is go a layer deeper and provide the analysis to help you make sense of the world. So the analysis comes later, but it's still fundamental and very important. I'm sure you all saw this in the news yesterday. This was a great example of how user-generated news happened just 24 hours or 48 hours, I lost my track of time already, ago. A plane crashes into the Hudson River in New York. And for those of you who've been to New York, that is a, you can imagine, a mesmerizing event. First footage caught of that event was of a person looking out their office window taking a photograph and a video of the plane coming down. The world was notified by an office worker that a plane had crashed. And slowly, everyone started poking out the windows and taking different photos and going to the scene and interacting with survivors. And because of the crowd's interaction with that event, the real hero came out, which was the pilot. The person who would have typically been thought of as the villain in that occasion, truthfully came out because of coverage in the microblogosphere and the blogosphere as being the hero. So just a very small example of something that happened not long ago. Now, there has also been a shift in fundamentals in the news business, which is very important. Number one, there is a lot of discussion about hyper-local news. Hyper-local news, as it ties to geography, is becoming more and more of a fallacy. Lots of newspaper organizations around the Western world have experimented with microblogging networks in neighborhoods and in cities. And the truth is, most people don't care. Most people, when they want to get hyper, hyper local news, expect it to be pushed to them. They will not come for it. So if I want to know about a garbage strike in my neighborhood, or a school closing, or a theft, or an arrest, I expect that I will be notified of that. I am not going to look for it. What has happened is we have moved to this era of the hyper-personal where it's no longer about where I live, where I live is a part of my person, but because we're all connected on this global basis now, the solar system around myself that I care about is much broader. And my locality, though I live in Vancouver, Canada, may very well be tied to an event going on in Assam, India, that I'm very personally connected to, but my local media would never cover, but it's more important to me than the garbage strike in my neighborhood. So we have moved to a very big change in the news business, and one of the most important changes was Facebook. The biggest change, in my opinion, in the last 10 years of news was Facebook, for one very simple reason, that it proved the theory that people were more interested in the hyper-personal than they were in the hyper-local. In North America, people under the age of 50 check their Facebook news feed 10 times to one to a traditional news feed on a daily basis. And when asked why, the reasons come in two. One is because this is the kind of news that traditional news organizations sloughed off. That's not news. If your kids have a birthday party and the photos of your nephew's birthday party, nobody cares about that. Well, they're true, they don't. But they care to you and a very small, isolated group of people who care. It was very hard and difficult to cover and aggregate, but now it's been done. The second thing is, what most people talk about in Facebook, especially people under 40, is that they are tired 
of turning on the news every day and getting depressed and seeing that the world around them is a constant reminder of failure and disaster and starvation and problems. And that their source on Facebook is actually the source of uplifting news. That it's about family, it's about friends, it's about social, it's about things that are important to them. So we have moved to this era of the hyperpersonal. And it is clear and undeniable, as I show you with you as always, that the crowd are better reporters than any journalist will ever be. On reporting, not on analysis. When you have 400 people at a scene, three people at a scene, they will always do a better job as a crowd in just witnessing and experiencing and sharing that experience than anyone else will ever do. Thirdly, we need to accept in the news business that you have lost a generation. I don't know if it was the same in the Middle East, but certainly in North America, if you were an intern at the Washington Post and you walked into the room 10 years ago and said, we really need to focus on 18 to 25 year olds. We never do any marketing for 18 to 25 year olds. You would have been laughed out of the room because the dirty secret of the news business was that they didn't care about people under the age of 25 because the assumption was when you buy your house, when you have your kids, when you have a mortgage, that's when you get it. That's when people start to read and focus on the news. Big problem. Most North Americans and now most people in the world developed their news consumption patterns when they were 12 years old on Google. So there is an entire demographic that has been lost that no longer goes and looks for news. They either search for it, they ask for it, or they get recommended. If you looked at people under the age of 30, the amount of people who type in an actual news site versus go to an aggregator or search for it has dropped by about a thousand percent. Fourthly, it is going to be really important in the next decade as more and more, as journalism becomes more expensive, and more and more journalists, which I think is a terrible travesty, get laid off. When two newspapers or two television stations compete in the same market, it's going to be very difficult to distinguish brand when everyone is getting their content from the same place. So the importance is to recognize that the advantage of this crowd, the advantage of the thousands of people that cover events, millions of people, is that it actually allows local markets to distinguish brand one against the other so that you're not in a position where you're taking content from the same three wire services over and over again. So what have we learned in doing this for three years? The first thing I would tell you is that in the world of user-generated content, almost no one is motivated by money. Every, I'm sure one of you was going to ask this question today. I would almost guarantee it that someone in this room was going to say, do you pay people who write for you and contribute? And the answer is no, we don't. And the reason we don't is because they don't care. When asked about their motivations for why they participate in this kind of stuff, it's issues like, I want to be part of a conversation. I want to follow and contribute to matters that are important to me. I got nothing better to do, frankly, which is one of the answers. And the other is, Money. And money is the last on the list every single time. And typically the people who are motivated by money go elsewhere. So money will not motivate people, which is actually not a good thing. Because if they were motivated by money, it's actually easier to monitor and negotiate and control the environment because you know what the lever is. It's hard to do it when they're not motivated by money. The second thing we've learned is that where we are today, is at a very interesting point in history. We are at the point now where Baron von Reuters and the creation of the Association of Press, Associated Press was 150 years ago. This is the reinvention of who will own the channel of breaking news. And if you think that that's some sort of exaggeration, as many people who are journalists do, I will tell you that right now we are seeing the Associated Press crumble before our eyes as their members leave, as they struggle to redefine their identity. And quietly, CNN has started its own wire service, which many of you may be familiar with. And CNN has started a competing wire service, which they've started to train people to believe is professional journalism, it's the same quality content. But what will happen, I guarantee you, in 12 months, 
is the vast majority of the content in photo and video that will be sold through to you will come from people like us. It will be citizen-generated media. So the cost of production of that wire service is going to plummet. So we are at the point of the battle of who is going to own breaking news today. Thirdly, if you want to motivate people and you want to get people engaged, reward them with editorial control and status. Those are the two levers that people seem to be the most interested in when they participate online. And lastly, when we started Now Public, we thought that user-generated news and mainstream media were two entirely separate worlds. But what we have learned very clearly is that going forward, one cannot exist without the other. Traditional media will die if it does not incorporate user-generated content in what it does. And user-generated content without traditional media is pretty boring stuff. Both of them need each other to coexist, and that coexistence will be defined over the next 12 to 24 months. So I want to end off by talking about what you can do. What can you do in this room as journalists, as people who work in the media, as human beings? What is the next 12 months going to hold? And what are some actual takeaways and things you can think about? The first is, it is very important to not make one of the mistakes that traditional media has done, which is to take their archives and lock it. So if you go to many newspapers in North America and Europe, if you want to do a search for a piece of content, they'll only give you the last seven days. Anything that's in the archive, you have to pay for. It's closed behind a firewall. And what I would argue is that it's suicide for newspapers. Because if you go back to what I said before, the vast majority of people under the age of 40 find their news through search. Now, in a search web and in a search economy, time stands still. The vast majority of what breaking means, if you click on a search and find a link, it is breaking to you, even though that story happened a year ago. Why? If you look at the heat maps on when people monitor news sites, you will see that the last thing that they look at is the date. Almost no one, when they search, why? Because they assume, this is my theory, it may be wrong, when people do a search in Google, they assume that Google is giving them the most timely, relevant results. So when you heat map a story, and you look where people are looking after a search, the date is the last thing they look at. So it is important to remember in a search web, breaking news has a very different meaning. And stories that are a year old or two year old can become very dynamic and very current by adding user generated content cheaply and efficiently live time to keep the story current and to keep ad dollars flowing into those stories. Secondly, whenever I speak to journalists, somebody inevitably always says that I speak about the death of newspapers as if it's something that I'm happy about. Let me say two things. Number one, newspapers are finished. Whether it's five years, or six years, or seven years, the amount of newspapers that will be handed out to people or sold will diminish to nothing. There will be some free sheets that will survive, magazines will survive clearly, but the local daily newspapers will not. And that is just a fact. The numbers are clear on that. And I can tell you my family owns a very large newspaper company in Canada, so I have just as much to lose as everyone else does. But the fact is undeniable. And so usually a journalist will say to me, you, you say that like it's a good thing. And the truth is, I don't care, and nor should you, because it's not about the medium. It's about the brand. Being upset that people aren't reading newspapers is like being upset that your children don't listen to music on vinyl records anymore. It's the same analogy. It doesn't make a difference. It's about the quality of content, not about the medium through which they consume it. And the longer we hang on to this romantic notion, notion about the newspapers as being the beacon of news, the more people will die and fail in the process. Thirdly, I think the role of news has not changed, but technology has enabled you to do much more interesting things. Instead of just doing analysis and reporting, you should act as an organization that connects people. You should think of a site for a news organization as a tour. You are taking people on a virtual tour of a topic, a topic that matters to them, that they're engaged in, that they found you on, and you want to connect those people to each other. You want to be the hub, the water cooler. You don't want it to just be about your analysis. You want it to be a place where people congregate. And your job on that tour is to be a tour guide. 
Your analysis is to help people and show people the way so that they understand very complicated issues when there's lots of different opinions and voices. The role of the news organization in the future is to be a tour guide and to connect people on their tours. And lastly, I think this is very important. Again, I don't know if it's the same in the Middle East as it is in North America and Europe, but I would really caution traditional news organizations from taking the philosophy of corking the boat. And what I mean by that is, every news organization that went online, all they did was they took their offline publications, pushed it online, and then tried to acquire companies which would stop the bleed in their revenue. So they would acquire classified companies, and auto companies, and job listing sites, and dating sites. Well, there's not many more of the left that they can acquire. So the question is, if you're not one of those people, and by the way, the ones that did acquire them still saw the revenue shrink. <coughs> the people who have been successful in the media business in using the web are the people who were bold. They made very, very bold decisions and recognized that they had to get out of the mindset of what news really meant. The New York Times. The New York Times bought about.com, $640 million-ish, depending on what currency. And they were laughed at for doing it. Well, today, it accounts for close to 75% of their internet traffic and close to 90% of their online revenue. People laughed at Rupert Murdoch when he bought MySpace. People in the news business could not understand it. He just paid $475 million for a little social network. And we all know social networks are like high school dances. They'll come and they'll go, and people will be popular, and there'll be a new one. Well, last year, MySpace did over $800 million in revenue, making up 90% of the revenue for Fox Interactive. And it has proven to be an incredibly sophisticated vehicle for spreading the news. So this is not a market to buy another job site, to buy another classified site. This is a time to be exceptionally bold and risk further failure. So where are we going? And this is where I'll end off. Everyone always asks me, where are we going and what's next? And the answer is, I don't know if I knew that. I'd be off on a beach somewhere. But the truth is, there is one thing that is certain. In 1992, Neil Stevenson wrote a book called Snow Crash. And in that book, he said that once we all start carrying recording devices on our person, that we will effectively, as individuals, replace some of the most important fundamental institutions in society, like the media, like the police and security. And lo and behold, he was right. So where we are moving is to this gargoyle culture where we need to assume that everything we do can and will be recorded, which means as human beings, you have a very different obligation now. When you pass by an incident, a discrepancy, an injustice, what is your obligation to record that? What is your obligation to communicate it? Because there will be laws, as the United States is discovering, around being a Samaritan, and it will be almost certain that it will be illegal in North America to walk by an injustice, especially a crime, and if you could have videoed it, did not. It also has another meaning which is we need to assume that everything you do can and will be recorded and that you are always being watched. And as creepy as that sounds, let me give you a small example of just the beginning of how that started. On Facebook today, the coaches in American universities watch their players very, very closely. American football players in universities are under almost consistent house arrest before games. And what happens on Facebook is you can be a quarterback of an American college football team and somebody takes your picture at a party. Now you don't know who they are, but they know you. And they take that photo and they upload it to the web and they tag it with your name. Facebook, by the way, is openly searchable. So now the coaches are able to see on Facebook where their players were at any given time without the players ever knowing the photo was taken, knowing the person who took it, or that it was uploaded to the web. So we need to be very cautious that that's the environment we're moving into. So I think this is going to be an incredibly challenging time for us around figuring out norms and who we are as people. 
And I thought the greatest thing ever said about news was actually said by a comedian, by Jerry Seinfeld, who said, I think it's amazing that the amount of news that happens in the world always exactly happens to fit into a newspaper. <laughs> and that is exactly the problem. So I thank you, and I really believe this is going to be an incredibly challenging 730 days. Thank you very much. The advantage that you have um, in any economy where newspaper websites are just starting to actually become serious and how they're taking it is you have a lot of lessons that you can learn from from what has already failed in the rest of the world and save yourselves a lot of time. The things not to do is do not spend a lot of money on CMS platforms that are going to waste a lot of money and time. Most of the production capability you need online is free and is a fraction of the cost that you would ever need to buy an industrial grade uh, system. Secondly, don't lock up your content, don't lock up your archives, don't be fearful of other people's news content appearing on your site, and remember the best advice I can give you is be a source. News is about people's lives, it's about things that they care about. It is the ultimate water cooler, I don't know if that expression exists here, but news is the ultimate conversation point. So if people care about it, create an environment where people connect with you and through you to other people around the things they care about, and let your journalists be the tour guide to help people navigate those waters. Those will be the most successful, I think, web properties and news over the next little while, and be very, very good at search engine optimization. You should have three people in your company, that's all they do full time, is optimize your pages for search. Any questions from the audience? Someone? Hi. Um, while, while you were talking, I visited uh, your website and it's one device here. And to check uh, something. Now, the first question which came to my mind, the first to say remark, is some, sort of about localization. And this is something who was missing uh, again in Tom's previous presentation here, which maybe I got a chance to ask him about it. Now, for me, uh, thinking that this is, uh, as you said, uh, one of the most uh, uh, known uh, site news uh, uh, websites in, in the world. So I thought uh, to look at what are the main news here. For somebody who lives in the Middle East, I think that Gaza uh, killings uh, will be some sort of major uh, thing here. Uh, while I didn't see anything, uh, in the world section there was something more important maybe about tap dancing. Now, this is very interesting. What is missing here is... Do you have a question? The question is... is I think I know what he's asking. Yeah, the question is, what uh, the people in, in, in any certain area around the world should do to uh, be part of this and, uh, and, and people should, uh, can be able to, to know what is happening around the world? Because what, what I saw here, mostly uh, something which is related to uh, certain markets in, in, North, in, North, in North America, uh, view, view around uh, the Western world only. Yeah. What about the other world, uh, parts of the world? Sure, so it's a great question. So just to, if I can just repeat this back to you. So you went to Now Public, you looked on the homepage of Now Public, and you saw a bunch of stories that weren't really that relevant to you based on where you live. So that is a question that my board asks me all the time. And it's actually a very important lesson, I think, for people in the news business. Less than 1% of our traffic comes to our homepage. The homepage is not the homepage. People come to our site and find the stories that they want when they look for them. See, in the 1990s and early 2000s, news business was fascinating with this concept of personalization. You're going to come to CNN and we're going to show you everything you want to see about everything you want to know. Well, it's failed. 
And it failed because it wasn't the way people searched or looked for news. So we took a very different philosophy, which was our homepage was there as a branding tool to explain to people what we did so that people, when you go to the site, what we want you to get out of it is not, here's a bunch of news that matters to me, because we'll never get that right. What we wanted to get right is that you understood what we did, and we engaged you and you wanted to participate. The, the thing that, the, the sort of dirty secret of the internet, which I think is very important, is if you ran the London Telegraph, or you ran the Sydney Morning Herald in Australia, four years ago, 80 to 90% of your traffic was local. It was coming from Australians or from people in Britain. Today, because of search, those numbers of local new, of local viewers are shrinking. So today, the Telegraph in London, where they had 80% of their audience coming from the UK, is now shrunk to 60%. And over time, that will go down to 50%, which poses challenges for ad sales and all kinds of other issues. So my point is, the homepage of any news organization should be used as a branding tool, because more and more search will drive the real homepage as the page they find that they're looking for. So that's why you may not see stuff, because we don't, we actually truthfully don't care about what you're looking for, because we expect you'll find it either through our search tool or through others. What you're seeing on the homepage of Now Public is what our editors feel are great examples of user-generated and crowdsourced stories. In terms of how you get involved, I think that was maybe one of your other questions, how do you do this? I think it depends on who you are, whether you're a journalist or whether you run a media organization or whether you're just somebody who wants to get involved as an individual. Um, and the short answer is get involved. There's, you know, to sign up in public, you can do it right now on your phone. It's, it's simple, it's easy to do, and start participating. You'll find that you'll start to build a community of interest in people. And in Gaza, for example, to answer your question, we have, um, we have as many people on the ground in Gaza as Al Jazeera does. The challenge was we weren't going to consistently put it on our homepage for four and a half weeks. It was featured coverage for two weeks, and it was enough already. The people who were looking for stories in Gaza found them. And then we moved on to other things, like the inauguration and things that were important for the rest of the world. So, so we have a very big interest in Gaza. We have six, actually, sorry, we now have eight people on the ground in Gaza that are covering it almost full time. I think uh, a question from our audience. We had uh, a lot of nervous journalism students in the room. They want to know what advice you have for current journalism students as they think about their future. Well, uh, Karen asked me the same question. I, got it. Um, I think actually Tom's advice is something I never thought of before, and, and I would agree with it 100%. Um, I would add one other thing, that the one thing that journalism, uh, journalism students surprise me, because we get asked to speak at journalism schools all the time, and when I actually ask a journalism class, how many of you have a blog? How many of you use Twitter? The numbers are very, very small. So the two pieces of advice that I would recommend is one, start using the tools. Start engaging in the community and understand the platforms that are going to be used for journalism in the future. And secondly, and most importantly, you need to become exceptionally good marketers. I think the one key thing that they don't teach in journalism school, which is going to make a huge difference in the future, whether you work for the New York Times, whether you work on your own as a blogger, whatever you do, you need to understand how to market your content online. That is going to be a fundamental difference between success and failure. And less and less will the organizations that you work for do that for you. They will expect you to do it on your own. So learn how to do it and do it well. Any more questions from the audience? Let me go to this, this woman in the back, right next to the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Could someone, Shalini, use her microphone right to, to the left? Yeah, right there. Thank you for your presentation. Um, did you experience any incidents where you received false reports from some people anywhere in the world? And um, how do you check the accuracy of information received or uploaded on the internet? And if there are, you know, there are false information, do you take them down? Thank you. So that, by the way, is the second most common question I get uh, from journalists. So it's a, and it is a, a fair question. So. Um, do you want the diplomatic answer or the snarky entrepreneurial answer? The snarky, the snarky one? So the diplomatic answer is that in an online environment, you get transparency 
much better than you would in a one-way communication. So if there are fallacious stories or illegal stories that are posted, in our environment, they don't last long because the community smokes them out very quickly. So rather than the typical linear chain of an editor and a writer, and then a complaints department, our complaints department is very public, meaning we have a system of 10, 12 professional editors and 500 volunteer editors that are constantly monitoring that stuff. And if it's false or fake, it gets smoked out very quickly, much faster than in traditional media. And as we know, the ratio of error in user-generated media and traditional media is about the same. Our philosophy is we don't edit anything. If it's illegal in the country in which it was uploaded, we will take it down. So if it's defamatory, hate literature, we'll remove it. But otherwise, we don't get involved. Now, the snarky answer. So I always have a struggle with journalists. Because journalists, I'm not a journalist. Um, I can barely, barely write my own name. But the, the, the truth is that journalists need to figure out what they are. Because they will often use the double-edged sword of being a craft and a profession. And it is not a profession. I'm a lawyer, unfortunately. <laughs> if I breach my ethical conduct, I will be disbarred. I answer to an authority. And I will never be able to practice law in any jurisdiction again. I will be completely removed from my, from my craft. And if I do it, I will be jailed. The question that I, always, that I always try to ask journalists to think about is, you cannot use the shield and the sword in the same breath. You can't say we are a profession and a craft. Because the truth is, if a journalist breaches their ethical code, who do they report to? And the answer is, in truth, no one. You may report to your editor, you may lose your job, but there is nothing from barring you from putting up your own blog or working somewhere else, and all we need to do is look at Henry Blodgett in the United States, who was the most villainized uh, analyst in the United States, who was barred from practicing the securities business that is now one of the most well-read bloggers about technology in the world. So, this concept or this high ground and pedestal that journalists sit on about ethics and fact-checking and all this stuff, to me, honestly, is nonsense. Because I think the truth is, journalism is not a profession, it is a craft. And that's where its high value is, because not everyone can be a journalist. Not everyone is good at writing. Not everyone can package and analyze a story. Not everyone is smart enough to be able to analyze that stuff. The same way that I'm not interested in watching you know, my family's home movies in the same way I'm interested in watching Spielberg. So I think journalists need to stop the traditional arguments against user-generated news about fact-checking and, and ethics and all this stuff because it's not relevant. And it will actually expose traditional media for many of the fallacies that you're actually setting yourselves up for failure. I think the truth is, do what you're good at, be great packagers, be great analysts, be great storytellers, and that's what the world needs. And there's going to be much more value in that than 50,000 reporters running around taking photos of everything they see. The irony is in this market, the journalists become more valuable than they ever were. That's the snarky answer. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? Hi, I was just wondering, is it possible in a country like Qatar where we censor the internet to have citizen journalists? Um, the, the short answer, I think, is yes. Um, you know, China, as you know, censors the web pretty severely, and during the Olympics they did it aggressively, yet incredible flow of information came through. I mean, there are so many very simple little things that you can do, if you know what you're doing, to work around it. I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, there's a tiny little program, which I will not mention, that you can download on your laptop and completely circumvent the network. So in Canada, I can't watch Hulu.com because it's barred in Canada because of the Canadian rights holders. Well, I can tell you I watch it every day. And they don't know that I'm coming from Canada. They don't know where my IP address is coming from. So it's very easy to do. And for the people that really want to do it, that's why you know, I agree with some of the things Tom said earlier about censorship and government involvement. And the, the reality is you can try to do it all you want, but inevitably this is the ultimate form of people doing what they really want to do. I think 
think on that note, we have to, to wrap up our session. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.